Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Gary. Um, there is somewhat of a joke between Gary and myself. Um, it's not, well, it's not totally a joke. It's actually quite true. Um, whatever happens to Gary is going to happen to me next. Um, it's amazing how I follow in his path. Um, just look at the hair as an example. Um, <laughs> but there is one very important way that Gary and I are different. Um, I don't necessarily get permission from my wife to tell stories about her from up here. Um, well, my name is Todd Malone. I'm the lead pastor here at FBC, and I am so delighted that we have this time together to look into God's Word. We take God's Word very seriously here. We believe that the Bible is God's inspired Word for us, and uh, we need to pay careful attention to what it says about who God is, who we are, how we are to relate to Him and to one another, and uh, not just pay attention, but to live that out. Um, and that's what we're going to do here in a second. We're going to dive into a part of God's Word, see what it has to say about who he is and who we are and how we relate and how we can live that out. Before we do that, let me, um, let me make a public service announcement. Uh, we, um, we recently had a tragedy at a church in the Fort Worth area. Uh, a gunman walked in and um, fired on the congregation. Um, this is an unfortunate occasion to remind us of what we have in place at this church for things like that. May it never happen. Um, I don't know if you're aware, if you were old enough, you might remember that a couple of decades ago, it was very popular for churches to do a skit in the middle of the service where someone would come in dressed up like a terrorist or whatever and carried a gun and that would be, you know, are you committed enough as a Christian to put your life on the line? Um, one of the very first, if not the very first, main church shooting that we had in this country took place not far from here. And many people were killed because they thought that what was going on was that skit. So we as a church and many churches have said, we will never, ever, ever create that confusion. If someone comes in and they're carrying a gun, it's not a skit. Um, the other thing that we want to remind you of is that we have a safety team. And safety team, if you're here, raise your hands. You can often... We can often see them. Uh, they have kind of little yellow tags. It's more than a lot of times they're also just out like in the lobby or around campus. So uh, it's not necessarily going to be the case that they will all be in here. Uh, these guys um, are in place to help us not only in a situation like that, but really anything that happens. If we have a tornado, you know, tsunami, zombie apocalypse, anything like that. Um, a medical emergency, these guys are th these guys are prepared to step in and help us as a church respond well. I don't know what we do for zombie apocalypse, but that's not my job. Um, that's theirs. So, so I hate to, to take time to address that, but I think it's important every now and then for us to revisit as a church. Uh, there are certain things that we do have that are kind of built in that if something happens, there is a way that we would respond, and also to clue you in, if something crazy like that happens, uh, we, you need to take it seriously. Um, we're not doing a skit. Um, so let's leave that topic behind. Uh, last week, Slade got us back into the book of Ephesians, which is what we've been studying before Advent, and we're going to wrap up Ephesians through the month of January then I'm so excited about this. We are going to start the book of Romans, um, and we're going to spend quality time in Romans. We're going to go through uh, at least the summer and take a very careful, studied look at Romans. 
Um, and in case you were not here last week, let's reset where we have been in the book of Ephesians. Now, if you remember, Ephesians is divided into two halves. The first three chapters of the book are all about what God did for the Ephesians. I think there's only one command in the entire first half of the book. Everything is about understanding who God is and what he has done. And that is so critical to Paul. He wants to change their thinking before he changes their behavior. And then we get to the second half of Ephesians, which is about how that thinking gets applied. What are the Ephesians to do? And we are in a section of Ephesians where he is talking about how we should live. In fact, Paul opens the second half of the book with instructions about how to walk. And there is this list of walk this way, don't walk this way, things like that, that start in Ephesians 4.1 and actually culminate in today's passage. So just a quick refresher, in Ephesians 4.1, Paul said to walk in a manner worthy of your calling in the way that he develops that thought shows that we are to walk in unity as the body of Christ and as a church. And in fact, the issue of unity is the, pre is the prevalent theme of the book of Ephesians. Because this is what God has done, how should you live? You should live in unity with one another. Because as we live in unity with one another, that's what shows the world who, who God is and what he has done. In 4.17, he says, do not walk as the Gentiles. And that he develops that by saying that we need to live holy lives. We need to walk in love, he says in 5.2. Because as we walk in love, we reflect the love of Christ towards one another. We need to walk as children of light. Slade took us through last week, and then this week, he wraps up this section about how we walk by saying we must look carefully at how we walk. Now, we kind of get the walk metaphor, but this was a common way of talking in the Bible about how you live daily life. How you just go through the routines, both the, the hard stuff of life and the normal stuff of life. And Paul is going to challenge us this week that we need to look carefully, pay attention, notice how it is that we go through daily life. Okay, let's see who is going to be honest. Um, who here has ever been lost? Now, here's the favorite one. Who here has been lost but didn't know it? Uh, I lived and worked in Dallas years ago, and my boss and I were invited to uh, come to Baylor's campus and speak to a group of business students. I don't remember what the occasion was. He was really the speaker. I was just the roadie. Um, and... We had a great time, really great interaction. These are terrific, terrific college students, very bright, very gifted. Uh, and by the time we were done and driving back to Dallas, it was late. We were exhausted, but we were really excited about our time. So we spent a lot of time in the car just talking away about everything we experienced, different students we met. Were there ones there that we would like to hire at some point and things like that? And we were so both tired and engrossed in conversation that if you've ever made the drive from Baylor North, you know what I'm about to say. We took, I wasn't driving, this is important to know. Um, we took 35 West instead of 35 East at that point, that crazy point where it wise. And we had no idea. Now think about the level of unawareness, of cluelessness that we would have to have. How many signs did we miss? You start by we missed the huge sign that says Fort Worth that way, Dallas that way. We also missed... Every one of those signs that said things like Fort Worth, 50 miles, Fort Worth, 30 miles, 
Fort Worth 10 miles. At some point, we should have figured out that we're getting close to Fort Worth. We're not getting close to Dallas. We also missed every single billboard that was talking about Fort Worth as the next paradise. We missed it all until we got to Fort Worth. And then we realized we were desperately, desperately lost and confused. We were trying to get to Dallas. We ended up in the completely wrong place. One clueless step at a time. And in today's passage, what Paul is doing is he is warning us against doing the same thing in our relationship with God. You see, all of us, and we've all experienced this, we can start to wander spiritually. We can go on the wrong road, go on the wrong track. And many times we are completely unaware that we took 35 West instead of 35 East. And so the question is, what do we need to watch out for? What are the road signs for us that let us know that we are on the right road? And that is exactly what Paul gives us in this passage. We are to closely examine our lives for signs that we are living wise, that we are living an understanding life, and that we are living a spirit-filled life. And that's what he lays out in this passage. And here how he is how he lays it out in this passage. The main core theme, the point, is that we need to look carefully, examine how we live. And then he sets that up with three contrasts. Not as the unwise, but as wise. Not as the foolish, but an understanding. Not drunk with wine, but filled with the Spirit. And then he develops that last point in more detail, and we will go through that. But Paul's main point is to look carefully at how you walk, how you live. And then he develops that in three contrasts. And the first contrast is in verses 15 and 16, where he tells us to fundamentally to live wisely. And the contrast, as we saw, is between living unwise versus wise. Now, if you were a Jew and you were living in the period where Paul wrote this and you're getting this letter, reading it or hearing it, you immediately would have clued into something. Because this is a theme, this idea of an unwise life versus a wise life is a theme that is developed constantly through the Old Testament. You run into it all over the place in Proverbs and the Psalms especially. And the Old Testament lays out there are two ways to live. You can either live as the unwise person or you can live as the wise person. And the Jewish person who heard this sentence from Paul would have immediately clued in, that's what Paul's referring to. And they would have also immediately clued in what it means to live as the wise person. Because throughout the Old Testament, again and again and again, the definition of the wise person is the one who fears the Lord, the one who knows God's word, and applies God's word. And that is Paul's point here. Live not as the unwise person, not as the person who lives as if God's word doesn't matter, but the person who knows God's word and applies God's word. And the reason we are to do that is what you have in verse 16. Because that is how we make the best use of time in a world that is characterized by evil. You see, what had been facing the Ephesians is exactly what faces us today. We and they live in a world where every single day we are met with opportunities to be tempted by evil or we are met with opportunities to be harmed by evil around us. We live in a fallen, broken world. And how do we make the best use of life in a fallen, broken world? And Paul's point is you, look, you need to look carefully, examine your life, that you are living wisely. What does wisely mean? It means to know and apply God's word. Okay, if you have been in church for more than five minutes, what I just said, you have heard a thousand times. Of course, in fact, any decent sermon had better say, you need to know God's word and you need to apply it. But what I want to do is step back and take a look at that from the perspective 
of what it means to examine our lives carefully. And here's the problem that we have. The second that we say we need to use God's word to carefully examine our lives, we immediately tend to put scripture in the wrong category. And you'll hear that category when you hear people say things like, the Bible is our manual for living. Or here's one of my favorite ones. The Bible is basic instruction before leaving earth. What's the problem with these? How many of you still have your manual for the TV that you bought five years ago? How many of you that have the manual get it out on a regular basis and read it? That's what we do with manuals and instructions. Manuals and instructions are designed to help us solve problems. And if that is our view of Scripture, then we will treat Scripture just like we treat the manual to the TV that we now completely know how to operate. It will be on a shelf at best, lost, or thrown away at worst. That is not how Scripture invites us to look at itself. Scripture invites us to look at it as something that is as important to us, as important as our daily survival as food. Right? Remember Jesus saying, man shall not live by bread alone, but by God's word. You see, if we really saw the Bible as as important to our daily survival as food, we would not need to be guilted into reading it. We would recognize that our very survival depends on it, that we would starve without it. But the problem is we don't think that's true. The problem is we think we do just fine leaving the Bible on the shelf along with the manual to the TV and pulling it off only when pulling it off the shelf only when we have a problem. And that's a lot like someone saying, I can be perfectly healthy on a fast food diet as long as I have a salad once a week on Sundays. You might think you're healthy. You might think you're doing okay. But a moment's going to come when you realize you're in bad, bad shape. Living the wise life and not the unwise life means treating the Bible for what it is, the very words of life. It's not a manual to help us when we get stuck. It's not just something on a to-do list that we check off every day and say, I met my spiritual obligation. These are the words of life. So what difference does that make to us practically? This is why every week, we challenge you, encourage you, plead with you, bribe you if we had the money. Take the passage and rewrite it in your own words. If you would, if you would stop and pause and take the time with Scripture to really think about what is God saying here, it will begin to transform you. If you every week this next year said at least one day during the week, I'm going to rewrite this passage in my own words. And then throughout the rest of the day or throughout the rest of the week, I'm going to ask questions of this passage. Questions like, what does it say about who God is and how he relates to me? What does it say about who I am and how I'm supposed to think and what I'm supposed to value and how I'm supposed to relate to God and others? If you were to do that on a daily basis, it will transform how you think, how you live, how you relate to your spouse, how you relate to your children, how you relate to your coworkers, how you relate to your fellow students, how you relate to your friends, how you relate to your enemies, how you relate to yourself. Paul wants believers to carefully examine 
how they live because they live in a world where there is constant potential to be either tempted by or harmed by evil. And the way to do that is to be immersed in, to soak in, to think about what is God's word? What does it say and how do I apply it? The second contrast that he has is in verse 17. And Paul makes the point that we must live with understanding. And the contrast is obviously do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. The word foolish is very straightforward. It means to, to not have good judgment. I had a friend in high school. Seriously. Not that I had a friend. No, I, I, that's, yeah, that's not the surprising part. Um, I had a friend in high school who's now a pastor, which should tell you something about pastors, um, who, when he was a high school freshman, would get on his bike, ride on our bike path, which was not straight, and which was in half-mile increments divided by roads. He would get on the bike path, ride from one end to the next, crossing roads on an unstraight bike path with his eyes closed. The fact that he never was killed or never killed anyone is simply dumb luck and does not change the fact that it was profoundly, profoundly foolish. Now, I did not get permission to share this because I just thought of this right now. So, um, Adam McMahon. <laughs> One of our pastors here at the church. What you may not know is that he was a cyclist, a competitive cyclist in college. Uh, he has won some very, very major races that people come to from all over. Um, when Adam gets on a bike, it is not like my friend Clayton. When Adam gets on a bike, he knows where he is going. He is aware of the feedback that he is getting from his bike. I assume. We've never talked about this, but I'm, I'm, so I'm kind of making this up. But um, I'm assuming that when he hears something, he knows his bike so well that when he hears something, he knows what the bike is telling him and he knows how to respond because he is a high quality, gifted and experienced bike rider. That is the picture when it says, understand what the will of the Lord is. It's understanding something in a way that you have deep insight. It was a word that was applied in that time to judges who had to weigh evidence and make a decision about guilt or innocence. So you can think about it this way. Verses 15 and 16 are about learning the road signs. Knowing what the road signs are that we have to follow, verse 17 is about knowing how to actually drive in light of those road signs. Verse 17 is often misunderstood. More stories from my childhood. I knew people growing up who believed that it was important for them to know God's will about what socks they were supposed to wear that day. And if they picked the wrong socks, they were in sin because they were outside of God's will. Um, that's taking your wardrobe way too seriously. That is not what Paul is talking about when he talks about God's will. How do I know? Because Paul has talked about God's will throughout the book of Ephesians. He starts off the book of Ephesians talking about God's will. He is an apostle of Christ because of God's will. He continues in chapter 1 talking about the purpose of God's will. And he's referring that we are predestined for adoption because of God's will. He talks about Christ making known the mystery of God's will which is that he would unite all things in him. He talks again in chapter 1 about the counsel of God's will, and he's referring to our having obtained an inheritance. But what's interesting is in verses 12 and 13, he immediately follows that up by explaining what he means is that God has brought us together and united us as one people, as one church. 
So when Paul talks about God's will in verse 17, he's already told us what he means. What he means is that God desires that people would be saved and they would be brought together into a united, harmonious community of believers who because of how they relate to one another, then express God's character into a watching world and more are saved. This is not about what socks you need to wear. It's not about whom to marry or where to live or which job to take. It is about God's will to save people, to bring them together into a community that reflects what he is doing and his purposes in the world. That is what we must understand. That is what we must not be foolish about. If you come into my light or you come into my office and you ask me the question, what is God's will for my life or for your life? Paul would have me start here. Before we talk about your job or your school or your anything else, we need to start with the question, are you in a right relationship with God? And are you in right relationships with the believers around you? That always, no matter where you work, no matter where you go to school, no matter where you live or what you do, is always God's will for you and God's will for this church. Practically speaking, what does that mean? That means we must pause and think before we hit reply on Facebook. We must ask ourselves the question, what are we showing a watching world? Are we showing that we disagree with someone and we think they're wrong? Or are we showing a watching world that we can disagree and yet it be clear that there is unity and love and acceptance and grace even in the midst of disagreement. It means we need to pause and think before you talk about someone behind their back. It means we need to pause and think before you share something you heard secondhand. That is what it means in Ephesians, to understand the will of God. It's not about, should you buy this car or that car? It's about how do you treat the people who are around you? Paul tells us we need to carefully examine our lives to be sure that we are living wisely, that we know God's word and that we live it. Paul tells us to carefully examine our lives to be sure that we live understanding what God's will is and what God's will is to see people saved, brought into a community that reflects his character, that more would be saved. And in the final contrast, Paul is going to talk about what controls our lives, and he wants our lives to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. The contrast is do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, let's be honest. He's probably not just talking about wine. If someone comes up to me and says, but I got drunk on vodka. So it must be okay. I'm going to say, well, I think you've missed the point. Well, I used cocaine. I spent all day long playing video games. <laughs> what Paul is talking about here are things that numb us, that we use to escape the reality of the world that God has put us in. And here's the other thing you need to know is that the way this is written in the Greek, it's talking about something that is continuous and normally characterizes someone's life. So this is the person whose life is characterized by this type of, of mind-altering or mind-numbing form of escapism. And part of what clues us into that is this word debauchery. The word literally means to be a waste. It's saying that this person continuously engages with a life or lifestyle with things of this world that make their life just a waste. 
by the same token, being filled with the Spirit is also continuous. It's saying that this is something that should happen on a regular basis and continuously, and we should grow in. So you see, the issue really comes down to what is controlling your life. And Paul's challenge is that it must be the Holy Spirit. And then he spends the rest of this passage telling us what it looks like for the Holy Spirit to control our lives. And there are three things. And the first is a life controlled by the Holy Spirit is a life that is engaged in corporate worship. Did you catch how he talks about corporate worship? Addressing one another. Do you think about that when you come in here on a Sunday morning? You know what we tend to think of? It's this is my me and God moment right next to a bunch of other people having their me and God moments. That is not how the Bible talks about worship. The way the Bible talks about worship is that, yes, there is a me and God moment. We are to sing to the Lord. But it is also an us moment. The very fact that we come together is an encouragement. It sends a message to one another. And if you want to know what that message is, it's helpful to know what he's talking about with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I did not know all of this until this past week. The word psalms, I knew this, refers to Jewish worship. That is what Jews used in a worship service. They would either speak or chant or sing the psalms. What I didn't know, this was a shocker. The word hymns, where that comes from, That was a word that was used for Gentile pagan worship. We don't like to talk about this, my favorite hymns. Well, we use it differently now. Um, What's Paul saying here? Paul is talking to a congregation that is made up of Jews and Gentiles. And he is saying, the people with the Jewish background, your style of music that you grew up with has an important place here. People from a Gentile background, your style of music, not the words to Zeus, your style of music has a place here. And spiritual is actually probably best applied to all three words. These are spiritual psalms, spiritual hymns, so it's not to Zeus. And then just general songs that they might have come up with on their own within the church. Paul's point is every single one of those has a place. What message would it send to a Gentile? who is standing in that Ephesian church to hear the Jews next to them singing with all of their might in the style that the Gentile knows and is familiar with. What message does that send? It sends the message that you are accepted here and you have a place here. What message does it send to the Jew when the Jew is standing next to a Gentile who is singing and trying to learn these psalms and do the best they can to sing it with all their heart? They are receiving the message from the Gentile that your background and your tradition is important to me and it's important in how we approach God. What message does it send when we as a church stand and sing the hymns as we understand hymns that were so important to one generation? And that generation hears a younger generation singing them passionately. My favorite moment this morning, they have no idea I'm going to say this. I heard my eight-year-old grandson when Mark Rodell was playing. I mean, he was playing a series of hymns. My eight-year-old grandson says out loud, I know that song. He is learning the tradition, the the important voices of our faith that have been so important. What does it say to a younger generation in our church when an older generation will say, I don't necessarily know this style of music, but I will sing with my whole heart. 
because this is in praise to the Lord. What message does it send if we say there's only one style of music that's okay here? Just as an aside, this is another reason that I'm not a fan of doing worship services that are geared on two different styles. Could you imagine? Could you imagine what Paul would have said if the Ephesians said, we're going to have a Jewish worship service and we're going to have a Gentile worship service. But it has become commonplace in our society. We're going to have a contemporary worship service. We're going to have a traditional worship service. How is that different? I can be convinced, but you're going to have some work to do. What message does it send if you just don't show up? We are to be filled with the Spirit, and one of the signs of that is that we are engaged in corporate worship, addressing one another, and singing to the Lord with your whole heart. And heart is not just emotions in the Bible. It is always a way of referring to the whole person. It is thinking about what you are singing in the words. There are some songs that we no longer sing here that are loved songs, but because they say things about God that are not true. Because we want to think about what we are saying. We must engage our will. If we are singing a style of song or we're singing in a key that is not a key or a style that you're comfortable with, your will can still engage to say, I will be at least mentally involved with what is going on here. And we're not comfortable with this because we're not charismatic, um, but even our body, that's why we stand. There is something that happens even when we stand. How can you tell if your life is a spirit-controlled life? Sign number one is that corporate worship is a priority in your life. It's a priority to address each other through worship. It's a priority to give your whole self to worship. Sign number two is regular thanksgiving. Give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you see in the name of in Scripture, it's saying for the cause of that person, to support that person's purpose, to support what that person wants or desires. And he is saying there is no circumstance ever that you will ever face that cannot be used for furthering the cause and purpose of Christ. And so every circumstance is a reason at some level to give thanks. You can spot that the Holy Spirit is at work in your life by your ability to regularly give thanks. And our last one is our least favorite. Be filled with this Holy Spirit, submitting to one another, Oh, and he'll raise the stakes out of reverence for Christ. Do you want to know the state of your reverence for Christ? The word submitting means to yield to one another. How are you doing with that? Are you someone who is characterized by needing to have your way? Are you someone who is characterized by needing to be right? Our reverence, our love and respect for Christ should lead us to serve one another. It should lead us to stop thinking that we have to be right all the time or that we have to get our way all the time. Yielding to one another is not something that we do naturally and therefore it is a powerful mark that the Spirit is at work. Let me set you up for this for next week. Guess what we get to next week? Wives, submit to your husbands. I'll be in Oregon. Um, <laughs> but you cannot understand that verse unless you understand that right before it, Paul has said to every Christian, you must submit to one another. And so the second a husband shows up and says, wife, submit. I hope the wife has two responses. First, husband, love. Um, but also, 
Well, what does verse 21 have to say about that? How does that work? But I'll let Slade figure that out next week. Um, Let me ask you a question. When you think of what are the marks of a growing, healthy Christian life, what do you think of? Do you think of, well, I need to read my Bible every day? Need to give to Christian causes? Get involved in Christian stuff? Support the right political parties? Support the right social justice causes? Those are all good. But none of those made Paul's list. Paul would say that the signs that you're becoming a more and more spirit-filled, spirit-controlled Christian is that you are engaged in and you care deeply about corporate worship. That you give thanks no matter what the circumstance is. And that you yield to others. You see, all that other stuff you can fake and you can do that without the Holy Spirit being present in your life. But you can't do those things without the Holy Spirit being present in your life. And here's what's both amazing and encouraging. Do you want to know how you develop a desire for corporate worship, the ability to give thanks, and um, I just lost you, the ability to yield to others? You step into it and you do them. And as you do it, the Holy Spirit transforms you. Parents, let me take a second and talk to you directly. And I'm not just talking to parents with children at home. I'm talking to parents in Encore who have adult children. Let me ask you a question. What are your children learning from you as the marks of a growing Christian? Is it a list of do's and don'ts? Or are you modeling for them, showing them, telling them that corporate worship is so important to the Lord that we will not just fit it in when it's convenient? Are you showing them what it looks like to give thanks even in the most troubling, frightening, difficult situations? Are you showing them and teaching them how to graciously support decisions you do not agree with, whether that's at church or in your homeschool group or in the Christian school or public school or wherever? Are you showing how you relate to other Christians and saying these are the signs that the Holy Spirit is at work in you? Pay careful attention to how you live. Is is it a life lived in obedience to God's word? Is it a life understanding that God's will is to see people saved and brought together into unity? Is it a life that is controlled by the Holy Spirit? Every single day, you must stop and take account. You must pay close attention to how you live. You must reflect on it. And then where necessary, you need to make course corrections. And that's the point. The point of Paul's passage, the point of the message. Daily reflect, daily correct. See, by the time my boss and I got to Fort Worth, it was about midnight. Well, actually, probably about 1230. Um, And here's what made it worse. He had to drop me off in Richardson. Which is, for those who don't know the Metroplex, that is the other side of Dallas. Then he had to go back home to Grapevine which is, again, the other side of Dallas. When you don't live carefully and you ignore the signs, by the time you get to the point that you need to correct, it's a much harder task than if you had just paid careful attention. Don't let that happen to your spiritual life. Pay attention to how you So our responses are very similar to what they are each week, but I just want to stay on these because if you will do them, it will change you. Rewrite the passage in your own words. Think through in your relationships. Who do you need to yield to this week and how how will you do it? Start your day asking the Holy Spirit to fill you and end the day with reflection. Reflect and correct. Correct.
We're going to close in prayer. And so I'm going to ask the prayer team to come forward. And, and why do we need to pray for a message like this? We need to pray because these are specific things that we cannot fake and cannot do without the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we must go before the Lord and ask us, ask for his help to make us into these type of people. Would you stand and join me in that prayer? These folks who are down here um, are here to pray with you. And if we have other prayer team members, I see they're making their way forward. When we close, no matter what it is that you need prayer for, we want to pray with you. And we certainly want to pray with you and introduce you to the God who loves you so much that he sent his son for you. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we ask that both as individuals and as a church, we would be filled by your spirit. Lord, we ask that our lives would be living applications of Scripture. That we would value seeing people saved and that we would value living in unity as a church. And that we would be marked as a people who are filled by the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we ask you for these things because on our own, we are not capable of producing those in our lives. But you take our efforts when we step forward and engage in worship. When we step forward and seek to apply your will. When we step forward and yield to one another. And we give thanks in situations that are incredibly difficult. Lord, you take those efforts and you multiply them in our hearts. And we ask that you would do that for us today. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Here's what we've said about God today. God shows us and God empowers us through the Holy Spirit to live a wise understanding and spirit-filled life. So our challenge is to leave here and do what we said at the close. Every day, reflect and correct. You are dismissed.